Okay, good evening. Hello, my name's Guy Opperman. I'm the Member of Parliament here. Um, it is, oh, sorry, should I start again? Are you all right? That's fine. Okay, sorry. So we are recording this for a YouTube. If you are sufficiently interested and you want to watch it back, hopefully all the tech works. And there is a live feed of this to everybody who wants to watch it, but who is either worried about COVID, couldn't make it, wants to have a look at this in another way. And Ofgem, who are the independent regulators of energy, are watching this and taking evidence as we go along, which we think is really cool because we are feeding in stuff from Bellingham Village Hall straight into the independent regulators' inquiry about energy provision. So and at the end of this process, as we'll talk about tonight, um, I'm going to be doing a big submission um, to both the independent regulators and all the various other things. I'm going to start, though, with COVID. So uh, we are still in a pandemic, so please keep your mask on at all times, all right? Um, you will see anybody who speaks um, on this thing, we, we're going to put our masks on when we're not speaking and things like that. Um, please be sensible about it. We are opening the doors. It's chilly, but that's the practical reality. We know that fresh air helps and the back doors are open. So we're trying to create as much draft as we can. We've tried to split you all up as best we can. When you ask a question, take your mask off, ask a question, then please put your mask back on. We are going to great efforts to try and make sure we do this safely. Um, although Omicron is going backwards, we're still are acutely conscious, conscious of it. Uh, and we want to keep doing these meetings and everything like that. So uh, that's my, my one uh, thing. As you leave, please be sensible as you leave for obvious reasons. Try not to get into too many chats and things like that. So I'll try and explain that what we're trying to do, the purpose of this. There are four separate meetings. We did one last night in Pontyland. Apologies if we sound like a broken record tonight. We think we'll actually be better by reason of having done one last night. So we did one last night in Pontyland. Uh, we did one tonight here in Bellingham. And in two weeks' time, we do one in Hexham as the sort of central hub for uh, the community here. And then the Allen Valleys was particularly affected by Storm Arwen. And we're going down to Allendale um, Village Hall to do the last one down there. Different communities have been affected in different ways. So for in, in, in Allendale, for example, the Allen Valleys, the farming community was particularly badly affected with real issues on stock and things like that. In Pontyland, it's much more urban and there was much more urban issues. I genuinely, I have communicated with lots of you. Some of you sent your questions in, which is wonderful, and I'll come to all of those. I genuinely don't know uh, the nuts and bolts of how your community was dealing with. That's an opportunity for you to tell me, but also we have representatives here. And so I'll, I'll introduce everybody in a second, uh, but we've got representatives of Northern Power Grid. And so Paul is going to be speaking on behalf of them. But there are also other representatives who are much more technical, no disrespect to him, as to the provision of power, how it works, um, how it is you get in terms of uh, the breakages in the system and what happens and, and so forth. Uh, so if we need to do there's some amazing people who will come in and who are on the ground. They're all local. They're all similarly affected to you and I. Uh, but and obviously the main event, with no disrespect to the others, is about sort of how we make sure that uh, the future reference power is uh, we, we dealt with better ways. The purpose, most importantly, of tonight, there's lots of things about the future and lots of things about other stuff, is to show everybody gets paid. It's really simple. There is a compensation process, and we'll discuss that process, uh, that goes through uh, that we want to make absolutely certain everyone gets paid. Northern Power Grid have pretty good records on everyone, but not everybody has got their check. Not everybody has it gone to the right house. Not everybody has got to the right addressee. And there are complications. And with any computer system, there are glitches. So uh, the most important thing is we're doing a whole bunch of these things and advertising it in the Quran and elsewhere to ensure everybody gets the due compensation that they deserve. All right. There are then secondary issues about what are called welfare payments, which we'll get into in a bit more detail. And we're making sure that those are dealt with. And there are some people to whom it's all a bit computer says no, it's all a bit complicated or it, you just need to sit down with someone. And we are blessed with uh, Ian on the left in the corner there and Chris on the right, who are coming to all of these meetings and are sitting down and having one-to-one -one personal contact, taking your details, and then following it up and making sure uh, that you have the capacity to do that. So that's what we're trying to do in that. So the most important thing is everybody gets paid. The second thing is everybody gets heard. Um, 
clearly there are a lot of people who are interviewed on telly, made representations on Facebook, couldn't get through to MPG because the comms went down, which we'll discuss in detail. But it is also an opportunity for everybody to come forward and say, this was my personal experience. I want A, MBG and Ofgem to understand this, but also B, and more importantly, I want to make sure we don't go through this again. And how do we learn lessons so that we are match fit for the future? And there is a precedent for this. So six years ago, we had the worst storms that we've ever had uh, in terms of uh, water and flooding with Storm Desmond on uh, December 2015. Now, uh, if we look back at Storm Desmond, we were not really ready for a storm of that nature. And uh, as a consequence, you know, huge parts of Hexham got flooded, vast parts of uh, Prudda and other parts of the community got flooded. And we had huge problems with Obington Bridge and many other things. Right? And there was a lot of flood damage to people's houses. And we then sat down afterwards and I did a whole series of meetings around the, the Tyne Valley and a series of meetings with the Environment Agency, Northumbrian Water, and a whole other bunch of stakeholders to try and make sure we were better prepared for next time, which is because why we now largely have lots of flood wardens. And the main transformational thing on flooding was the uh, decision that we managed to reach between Northumbrian Water and the Environment Agency and the government effectively, uh, that Kielder Reservoir in the winter months is now run at about 85 to 86 percent, and it's not run at 99 to 100 percent. Because the consequence is, if you're running at 100% of the reservoir and you have a bad storm, it just goes straight over the top and straight down the valley. If you're running at 85%, it can accommodate a massive amount of water. And the impact, if we'd have done this before, Corbridge wouldn't have flooded, most of Hexham wouldn't have flooded, huge, huge tracts of the community wouldn't have been affected. That's exactly the sort of intervention that we're looking to try and deal with tonight. And... I'm certain we can do this, and I'm certain from the conversations we had last night that this is something that we can ensure uh, to be absolutely much, much better prepared going forward. I also want to make sure that, you know, there's three investigations going on. County Council are doing what's called scrutiny committee. Um, the uh, Ofgem, which is the independent regulator, are particularly looking at energy provision and holding uh, energy companies to account and making sure that if there are changes to be made, those changes will be made. And they are independent of government, they're not run by government, uh, and they are very robust and they have lawmaking powers and they have perfect capacity to do stuff. And then finally, the Department of Business is looking at how uh, all of the businesses were affected by the practical reality of loss of power, and more particularly, the wider impact on the community. And we will talk, uh, as we did last night, about, for example, the inability to communicate by landline, let alone by mobile, and there are some wider policy questions, some of which are for government, which is what we all realized very clearly was it in, in, a, in the 21st century where we are desperately reliant upon electricity to do communication by internet, by mobile phone. Uh, we are going to have to have a plan for what happens when uh, these things break down, because we will have a storm of lesser or greater degree, we hope lesser, uh, it, that will come again. And how do we get this community and the wider community from Kielder to Rochester to um, Otterburn and beyond, absolutely ready for this in the future. And there are really good ideas on that. Um, and, the, and the final bit is to try and also convey in a way that you just can't do on TV or on uh, a radio show, some of the great work that all of these teams have done, and I'll introduce them in a second, but also so that you can understand that all the various people who you pay for, it for things for, what they actually were doing and how it is they were responding. Because, uh, I, I, you know, it's often the case that I well remember I was asked to be interviewed by the BBC once and they said, we want to talk about Brexit, but you've got 12 seconds. Uh, and that's the nature of TV interviews. They're extraordinarily brief. You don't have a chance to, where, to meet the person on the ground and say, well, that's what I was trying to do. And this is why we did this and we prioritised in this way. That's what we're going to try and give you the opportunity to do. So I'm going to introduce everybody. We'll do, give certain people a chance to uh, explain what they did and who they are, so you have a full understanding of that. And then in about 10 or 15 minutes, uh, we'll come to some of the key questions. And I can tell you now what the key questions are. We will have a chat about you know, why it is the um, many, many people were told you'll be connected in 24 hours, and it just wasn't connected in 24 hours, and how that impacted on people and how that could be better. We all know and we all accept that this is the worst storm in 
uh, frankly, anybody's memory. Uh, but at the same stage, communications by MPG across the board were really poor, and we just couldn't get through to them. That is patently clear. Everybody has stories about that. Uh, thirdly, we're also going to look at the role of what's called the Local Resilience Forum and how that can be improved and how we can ensure that we are uh, match fit going forward. Because the Local Resilience Forum is the local group that is trying to handle serious crises. And it handles everything from flooding <laughs> to big storm events like this. Uh, and also, we're then going to try and uh, address some of the nuts and bolts about the, the minutiae of how you get payments and things like that. All right. And then if I haven't dealt with your question already, and I've got a bunch of written questions, I will then invite you to, to give to let us know your question and also share your experiences. So uh, we're going to hear from three groups first. So um, Paul is going to talk on behalf of MPG for about four or five minutes. Um, then I'm going to get Jim to talk about Northumbria water. I don't think many of you lost water, but I do think it's irrelevant to know what we're going on. Um, and then we're going to get Alex to give a, a quick overview from behalf of the uh, Forestry Commission of Forestry England as to what they have done and are continuing to do. Also, not least because things like access really matters going forward. Uh, and they, you know, we have not. I went up to Kielder only last Friday and, you know, they reached a decision that, you know, they're going to have to get generators to improve their connectivity going forward. So, uh, Paul, do you want to explain who you are, yep. introduce your team, and also then give the sort of five minute overview of MPG? Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Paul Glendinning. I'm the. Can you tell us a bit if you can go to the MPG? I'll do my I'll do best. Thank I'll you. do my best. If you want to come down the front, where it's, there's a seat in the front, if you want to come, and we'll then we'll keep shouting, though. I'll do my best. I haven't got the voice of that. Yeah, Paul, Paul Glendinning, I'm the um, Director of Policy and Markets at uh, Northern Power Grid, and I'm um, assisted tonight, um, Chris Mitchell at the back, and Ian Miller sitting beside him, taking your queries and uh, uh, helping you with compensation points. And at the front here, I've got Matt Preston, who's the General Manager for this region, and Jeff Hunter, who's an Engineer Manager in Matt's team, um, so we'll be able to cover all of the bases that we go through. I've got a five minute update. I'll get through the brief of the story. I've got two and a half hours of material here and a lot of detail if we need any detail. Um, but the, fir the first thing really that I want to say is to thank everybody for, for coming out. We do an amazing amount of stakeholder engagement, engagement in Northern Belgrade. And we're always talking to people about our plans for the future, etc. cetera. Um, on this storm, Arwen, we will be holding some of these sessions, but we are here to listen. Um, we know that it's been incredibly difficult for our customers, and we want to work with you, learn some lessons uh, from the past storm, and try and take it forward. That's 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 our aim. So we'd like to help you with tonight. Um, try and give you an understanding of the storm. And living up here, you'll know that it was a bad storm. There was a lot of wind. Um, we got very very good Met Office data. Um, we were well prepared. We stopped all work in advance um, of the storm coming on normal uh, projects. We had uh, everybody that worked for us called in under a storm bank arrangement um, for that weekend, ready to go because we knew there was going to be substantial damage. Storm hit around about 10 p.m. on the Friday night, mm -hmm. and it came in. Some people here might know more, more than me about this. It came in sort of north of Bambra area, and it, it just went across the region. Um, we gave a lot of damage. And in that period of time, over the between Friday night at 10 o'clock and Sunday morning, we had 280,000 customers off supply in the region. As well as the wind being strong, it also came from the north. We have river valleys in our region, from the north of our region down to Lincolnshire, um, and they are east-west running. And our lines are running east-west. As the north wind came through, it carried ice, and what's called ice accretion goes onto our lines, so that the uh, line starts off as thick as your thumb and was ending up as six or eight inches of ice around it, which was just pulling um, wires and poles over. We've got some terrific photographs uh, to show the damage. For example, um, the biggest area of damage was in Weirdale, where we had 35 kilometers of, of line down in one in one run and then another 30 kilometers in connections around it now on the sunday because due to the fact we had 280,000 customers off supply 
everybody's trying to get a hold of us. And that's where the next thing that happened in our problems started to hit us. Our website was overwhelmed by the demand and went down. The calls on our website, the you concurrent users on our website, the peak of that concurrent use didn't drop till the Thursday, not to BAU levels, but to the highest level that it ever seen in its life beforehand. That's the scale of the access on the website, and how digital the world is moving that everybody wants to go on your website. The website went down. It was down for a day or so until we moved all servers that we had to back up the website to provide extra access to run onto that to website. Then what we found was that the phone system was overwhelmed. And we had 360 BT lines running into our contact center. And on that day, on that Sunday, we had 20,000 calls that got through. Some people were waiting four, five, six hours, I know that. Um, but 20,000 people got through when our average contact center levels are 850 calls a day. So we, we were overwhelmed, and there's no doubt about that. The website and the phone line system it was overwhelmed. The next thing that comes into our um, issues register is that the website, under normal condition, for example, if there was a, a HB fault between Hexham and here tonight, there's an algorithm running in the background that when you go onto the website, it says, oh, this postcode, on average, this is when you'll be back on supply. We give you an estimate. And that, that comes to the guy's point about the 24 hours. Now, 280,000 customers were off on the Sunday morning. In the 48 hours of the storm, after the storm hit, we had 90% back on. Okay, so, the, so for 90%, the automated messaging was right. Now, when you take the 10% the 10 that wasn't back on, it's still 30,000 people. And then 30,000 people, including probably some in this room, they were trying to get through on those lines that I said was really busy. Also, what was happening was that we realized by the Tuesday that we needed to take the postcode map off the website. We need to take it down because of the wrong information was going out. So it was better to say no information than bad information. So we went to a position by the Tuesday or the Wednesday of that week where we had two categories. Uh, category one, these postcodes will be worked on and you'll be back on tomorrow. Or category two, the bulk of the people left over were still in the fog of war that we were still planning to work out how to get those guys back. And then as the week went forward, that those people in the fog of war tripped into you'll be connected tomorrow. And again, that, that was done on a on a quite an optimistic basis that you'll be back on tomorrow. And still we failed sometimes, which we are aware about, that it tripped into the day after. So we had those communications issues, that, that's for sure. On the other side, the wind not only was very strong through that Friday night into Saturday, but it, it, it blew long and hard. So what we would normally do in these situations is when we have overhead line damage, we would normally put reconnaissance helicopters into the air to take photographs and to try and track the damage. We had four helicopters, two were trying to fly on the Sunday, but the wind was so strong they couldn't get in the air. So they were taking wind readings from the major meteorological stations in the area. So we have that data, and it shows that, that the choppers got into the air on the Monday, and it, it was until 8 o'clock on the Monday night. So that's all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and all day Monday. We've got no real information. We had roads blocked. We had snow uh, on roads. We were sending runners with four-wheel drives to try and get through. But the scale of the devastation, particularly in Weardale and the Tees Valley, was, was unbelievable. So by the Tuesday morning, we were doing several things. One was we set up a, a, a project a team in Weardale and Teesdale to do a rebuild. And, and they were on rebuilding that. We thought they would be last. We, the plan that we had was that we thought everybody in Northumberland would be reconnected, but we would still be still building in Weardale. That actually wasn't the case by 24 hours. Because what then started to happen was we realized once the helicopters had been up on that Monday and Tuesday, and we were flying helicopters all week, I don't think anybody saw them. But we were picking up the damage in Northumberland, which was um, what we would describe as sparse damage. So there wasn't just one big line down. 
it was damage everywhere on the Northumberland network. And, and in Northumberland, there was some ice accretion and wires going over with poles, but it was also um, windborne damage. So whole trees were coming out. I mean, there's a cut here for the forestry. He'll tell you the size of trees that were uprooted and stuff. Whole trees smashing into our system and knocking them. So that said, a terrific damage. Um, we got everybody back on, I believe, by the following Tuesday night. Um, and then almost immediately when we got people back on, we started to think of compensation and how we would do that. And just for, for clarity, we know we have guaranteed standard, it's called guaranteed standards of supply. We have 90 days to pay people compensation from a from a normal fall. We we knew the scale of devastation was so bad and there was a lot of uh, vulnerable customers affected. We wanted to do it quickly. This was around about the 6th, 7th of December. We knew that Christmas was coming um, and that would be a great milestone if we could get a number of checks out by Christmas. We estimated, because at that point we're still estimating, we still don't know exactly how many people are off. There's some detail behind that I can explain. But in essence, the, the straightforward, I was on the back of an HV fault and we know your name and address because we don't know everybody's name and address because we don't send you a bill. We're a distributor of electricity, not a supplier of electricity. So we don't have everybody's name, but 24,000 from the 30,000 that we estimate will receive compensation, receive checks before Christmas, which was an absolute fantastic effort uh, to get that through. However, there are at least 1,600 people in a queue getting emails sorted through that we're working on that received checks with the wrong name because we didn't have the right up-to-date details from the suppliers or um, people that we sent checks to that didn't live there apparently um, and also people that we missed because we moved at pace with using the two computer systems and putting the two things together. So there was compensation going on and we've paid those checks. The remaining 6,000 or so that we think are going to receive checks we're working through now and we're over 1,200 of sending those checks out as I speak tonight. In a month's time, this will be gone. This will, we'll, we'll have it done. So if we were speaking in four weeks' time, I'm sure there'll be everybody would have received the checks. So there's compensation, which is the first thing, and then and Guy touched on it, upon it as well. Once we knew by the Tuesday that we weren't getting this back quick, we then moved to suggest that people moved out of their homes or went to friends and family because um, we said we would pay for that, and we'd pay for that accommodation. And we're taking those calls in that week. We booked 1,300 hotels for people to move out into in that week uh, as, our, as part of our goodwill. We were putting food vans out, we were setting up rest centres where people could go get warm and have a hot meal and then and pick up uh, packs from the LRA. So we moved on to onto the welfare side and we're still working through that. And I know there'll be a lot of questions around compensation, welfare and that. So I'll leave it there and then come back to some questions. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks Paul. Uh, so um, on behalf of uh, Nathema Water, can I ask Jim to just give a sort of two minute overview of where they are and also more particularly introduce the team in case there's anybody who wants to raise stuff on water supplies i don't think there is but that's things but also more particularly one of the issues um or if you just come a little bit yeah one of the gym we'll both moved down a bit um and then uh we're also then in a position that uh self-evidently some people particularly farmers have water powered by electricity and how we deal with that going forward is going to be a key issue not everybody is here tonight who would necessarily be affected by that but again, it's one of those logistical problems that we're going to have to come up with a plan. Jim. Thank you, Guy. Evening, everybody. My name is Jim Howard. I'm head of Water Networks for Northern Room Water. Firstly, I'd just like to introduce some of the team. So we've got Richard Urban, the operates distribution network in this area. We've got Rachel from our customer team. And we've got Judith from our comms team. Primarily, we're here to get any feedback where we could improve on how we perform through Storm Arwood. But if you've got any individual questions that you'd like to ask us at the end of the meeting, please come and see us. I'm sure we'll be able to resolve any problems that you've got. Our main problems that we faced throughout Storm Arwen is that we lost power, mains power supply to over 55 of our operational sites. This made it extremely challenging to, you know, to treat and distribute our water in our normal day-to-day -day manner. In addition to that, we lost comms across the network. So this meant our central control room 
were unable to move water around the network like they would do on a normal day to day basis and respond to events. Finally, we were faced with um, falling trees and snow that made it difficult for our people to get out there and uh, respond to either asset failures or respond to, to customers. We had some real um, examples where our people went the extra mile. We had one, one group of individuals who was, we needed to turn a valve off. A tree had come a lot down. They actually walked three miles to <coughs> turn that valve back on to get uh, customers in su to supply. We've got loads of different stories like that, that we could go into if we had the time and we haven't. But finally, I'd just like to thank all of our customers here this evening and all of our customers on the, on the stream um, for their patience and, and their support that they showed us throughout the event. I'm now handing back to, to Gav. Jim, thanks very much indeed. And uh, you know, self-evidently, we're talking about power tonight. And the main event is, you know, how do we get electricity back on? But you've got your mainstream, um, to give the pun, uh, water provider who's got exactly the same problems. And they're going to have to work out how their comms are going to have to work better, how they're going to have to have backup power, how they're going to be able to function uh, in circumstances when electricity goes down in a similar event. And they're learning lessons just as much as NPG and the <laughs> local authorities and others are. So um, uh, Alex works for Forestry England, lives local. Um, can I ask you to come up? give a quick overview of what you guys are doing. And then I'd particularly like you, given this is very much the up and all the time, just give us a two minute overview of how you think opening up Hielder and things will happen going forward. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, good evening ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a number of you will know me, Alex McLennan, I'm the Recreation Public Affairs Manager for the Humboldt Forest of England. And I live in the village and we've been here nearly 70 years, so it's wonderful to you like, recognize me. Um, yeah, it's really interesting and fascinating to hear the detail of uh, how um, the facts and the storm came in because I was actually up at Kiel at 10 o'clock at night when it happened. And two things I learned that night was we know about the storm quite a lot now, but it wasn't just a continuation of a storm, it was very big gusts. I can assure you it was a high wind, and some of you involved with it that night will know that what I say. We had a car rally, the Roger Albert Clark, um, taking place. It was the last big event at Kiel. We after COVID, we had 12 months of public events every single weekend, truncated into three months. It was something else to do a whole year's program as a Kielder. And our finale of 2021 was we just chuck in a storm as well. And that's for us what it's like on the ground. Um, we realised about 8 pm that it was beginning to gather momentum and the rally was at its final stages. And that was the point every started back in the forest. So I was out at 10 o'clock at night walking up. Um, we got in the forest, except one crew at the south of the forest who was stuck in the snow. snow. They were the mop up crew taking the signage away. And it wasn't the wind, it was just the fact there was four inches of snow behind the wharf down towards Hadrian's Wall. Really fascinating. Backs up exactly what Evan said uh, already about how snow and ice came in. And really <coughs> in that. Whereby at Kiel the Village, and there's some people from Kiel the Village here tonight, there was no snow at all. And actually, in some of the lower levels at eight, nine o'clock at night, it was slight wind to kill it, but it was nothing like what was happening higher up and towards east. Um, the following morning, um, again, back out first thing in sight, we, like everybody else, lost communications. Um, we couldn't communicate to each other. A number of our team uh, got out straight away, including myself. And our um, big harvesting machines actually got out and started opening up the day and going through the village, so you know that, because we identified that Kielder Village was now cut off. If something happened in an emergency, um, we just got on with it, we just got out the public highway, some of you know the local foresters just got out and did that, and the priority was to start opening up the public access. And the first priority was to clear the road to a community to get out. The secondary objective was then to start getting our foresters out of the ground. As some of you know, Kew the Water Forest Park is 250 square miles. It is a sub-county in its own, mainly trees, dark skies in Europe, etc, etc. But we've also got people living in trellings which uh, live in the forest. The, the humorous bit, if you like, in all this is we have got some individuals who live in the forest who are completely off grid. So for them, Storm Island has not been an impact whatsoever because they've got a wind tower by and they were fine. However, we do have a lot of homes in the edge of the forest or inside the forest that does have power. And as you said today already, the, the big issue was we knew we had these houses in the forest, but they could not get exit the forest, emergency access, let alone the utility companies coming in to do the good work. Trees were blocking the route. So 
over the whole weekend, uh, the team was around assessing, doing what they can. And, and forgive me for stating the obvious, for most people know this, with the storm damage to trees, and I think, Guy, you saw this last week first half, you can't just die out and grab a chainsaw and go and cut trees. That's the worst thing you can do. And the, the interesting facts, and I think okay, other experts around the table tonight know this, the wind changed direction during the storm, which is actually not only did it come in from the north, but it then changed during the night as well, which is quite something else. So as you go around the countryside, you've probably seen the trees a bit like kerplunk. They haven't just fallen in one direction, they've actually fallen in multiple directions. And that's because the wind started changing direction during the storm. We have a forest that are kindling behind Rothbury, and in that area, which is very steep gully, those who know it, it's very the edge of chariots, the wind was something like 110 miles an hour, and it came to a really steep face, and then the wind changed direction and just concentrated the trees like a bit like a Mr. Whippy ice cream. And that was to be the force of the wind. So that's what we're up against out the ground for utility companies and ourselves. So we worked through getting the access open to the house, the homes at the key priority, working alongside the utility companies, getting the power lines reopened as quickly as we could. Um, the big challenge for all of us out managing trees right now is there's not enough contractors from the ground just to go and do it. Because yourselves had them out doing power lines, we were trying to access the roads, using the cars and machinery. And you soon mop up all the talented people who've got the correct qualifications, the correct safety equipment, etc. And there's only so many people who can go and cut trees at once. So that was the immediate reaction to the storm from Forestry and Lynn Stark in the health and safety of police, managing it in a measured way because we just can't go in there and, and do the wrong thing and start having accidents. That's, that's just not how you do it. Um, the next point was um, we identified the queue the village had been off grid for quite a period of time. The family of water and ourselves provide uh, free food to the villagers. We put in our catering van, and instantly, some of you might have seen the news, the forestry and the catering van actually went away down to Allendale because our operator from Kielder, who was at Winter Wonderland, couldn't get his vehicles out of Winter Wonderland. So we said, yes, the forestry and the vehicle can go down to Allendale. It might look a bit odd that a forestry and catering van's in the middle of a village, but that worked really well. I think that was where the joint up thinking did work well indeed. Um, where we are today, it's amazing, we're nearly in the middle of uh, January already. Um, we're still on with open up forest roads, believe it or not. There's still some forest roads out there across the whole of the Nefumbland patch, uh, which are blocked. If you've been watching over the herd or the media, you'll have picked up Scotland have declared over 8 million trees came down that storm. We have a lot of trees down in the Nefumbland. We have certainly got beyond 100,000 trees. You'll have seen that guy last yeah. week. But we're working in a measured way to work through that. So. We will continue to manage the, the point we get all our forest roads reopened again. And the great news is we're also at the same time trying to open public access. Public access, as we know from the Bellingham area, um, the North Town Valley, is a big part of the community here. We know that they, a lot of businesses thrive and depend on it, Kielder the Waterside, for example. Um, there's a lot of jobs in this valley which are dependent on tourism. We know that. So what we try to do is do the quick wins. So I can tell you very quickly, for example, Wargs Barn down at Stonehoff Community, that is now fully reopened again with diversity in place as of today. We're now working at Sidwood, which is near Bellingham for dog walkers. We cannot open Sidwood fully for probably several months because there's so much damage, but we will have it partially open. So what we'll try to do in a, in a measured way is give access for walkers and also cyclists and horse riders. So I couldn't tell you tonight the percentage would go open, but for example, the Lakeside Way, which is 26 miles around the edge of Kielder Water, Sadly, the South Shore is quite badly blocked in several places. It will take a number of weeks to reopen. But we already got two circular routes on the North Shore open, which gives a bit of access for about 12, 13 miles. So before Christmas, we had opened about 40 miles of public access before Christmas Eve for the public to come and enjoy their well-being, outdoor recreation, and support the lo local businesses. Um, by the end of January, we'll be in a different place. It's just difficult to commit to say we'll have X or Y open because some, and the affiliate companies I'm sure uh, will agree with me on this, the challenge we've also got is trees are still falling down. So it's not over. So we have a lot of trees out there which are now very vulnerable and we only need one more wind. And then the ones that are a little bit topsy-turvy, it's best we describe them, they've got weakened root systems because they've lost all the protection from the previous winds. And I know there's some forestry experts amongst the audience which is great, we know this. Baroness, for example, which just has been really devastated. But there's some more trees coming down. So when we go in to check a site, for example, we get the six, seven miles. And I've done this personally thinking, today I'm going to get up to look at this problem and see what's going on. I find I can't because five more trees have come down overnight in the wind. So just be alert to that as well. So I think we're in a good place, says he. 
Um, of course, we're not out of window yet, Guy, either. No, no. That's the other challenge. Yeah. But that's a quick uh, heads up to... That's really helpful. So, listen, Alex, thank you very, very much indeed. Um, and obviously, everyone you've heard is going to be available for questions if you want them. I think the one sort of rider on what Alex is saying is... Um, so this has a massive impact as a storm on individuals. All of us lost power. I've got three trees still down in the garden. You know, all of us have lots and lots of impacts on uh, ability to go places, do things, loss of freezers, uh, nights out, ability to get out of the village. But it is also a massive business impact. And we are really trying very hard. And it's important that, you, you know, because lots of you will work in this community, that we need, you know, tourists to come back. We need the businesses to be up and running. And we need, you know, everything from the Lakeside Way to all of what Northumbria Water Run at um, Kielder back up and running because Lord knows we've had a tough enough time with COVID and just to make life fun, they decided to bring us the storm of the century. Um, so we're, there's a real uh, drive. I'm not going to hold Alex to uh, any particular dates, but certainly we have windows in our mind. And the clear idea that we're looking for is that to be as close to utterly normal by Easter. And I'm giving him quite a lot of latitude because I think probably we can do it earlier. Than that. <laughs> but if by Easter we can pretty much say Kielder is open for business and all the bits around, that is going to be a massive step forward so that all the businesses can reopen and we can hopefully, uh, post COVID, get back to some degree of normality. Right. I'm going to get into questions. So let me explain. Um, so some of you have submitted questions. I'm, I'm going to try and uh, bunch them together. So I'm going to get Paul to answer two key points, which would be. How does the actual compensation process work? How do you get your £140? And how do you actually calculate your welfare payments? And then secondly, I'm going to ask you about comms. But I'll do it as a preliminary to that. Lots of people have written in saying, I haven't been paid. And there are some people here tonight who have not been paid. Some people have written in, I think it's Diana wrote in, that there was a check in the wrong name. And uh, David wrote in, um, that, that, sorry, Diana said the wrong check. And David wrote in the wrong name. So there's a simple start to that. For anybody who's got individual nuts and bolts problems, uh, Ian and Chris in the corner there have, some of you have already seen them, but if you haven't seen them as yet and you've arrived a bit late, those two work for MPG and will deal with your individual nuts and bolts problem of you sent it to the wrong house, wrong name, you haven't given me the right amount, I don't understand my welfare payment. Please, can I speak to someone in English? So I'm going to leave most of those. If anybody wants to come in and say, well, I haven't had a chance, I'll come back to you. But the two biggest problems are explaining how we get the compensation, so what exactly is people entitled to? And the second bit is the communications, because everybody here knows that the, the repeat, A, the inability to get comms uh, either by email or by phone it just wasn't good enough, and how are you fixing that going forward? Because... Forget about what government's going to make you do. Forget about what the regulator's going to do. What are you doing already? What's your plan? And then more particularly, um, how, how is it that, you know, you had a situation that you were telling people repeatedly it's every 24 hours? And I know you touched on that, but I just want to try and clarify that. So, and, and the one bit I'll say on the 140 pounds, I'll, I'll come to you in a second. Let me, let me try and answer that. The one bit I'll say to you on the 140 pounds is that that is something that applies across the country. It's not a situation that it's this company is treating people in this particular way. Ofgem is an independent regulator and sets this matter. So I didn't add one final point before uh, Paul jumps his feet. People fixing this problem are not just MPG people. So previous storms, we've tried to learn lessons. And there is an agreement between energy companies, right? So if the energy company uh, in Northumberland has a problem, but there's no problem in Wales or Northern Ireland, those energy companies, because linesmen and the specialist people are really, really specialist, and you just can't send anybody up to fix a power cable, they have to, they're required to send their people who they've got spare to go and help. So that is why in Bambra, it was picked by, uh, fixed, all fixed by a very bun nice bunch of Northern Irishmen. Apparently, they were very popular in the pubs. And um, uh, there were some people from Wales coming up. We, we have people from all over the country coming to assist. And that is already part of the resilience planning. We think we can do more, but that's an example of what they've already worked out previously, and that was what is in place. Trust me, if that hadn't existed previously, we would really have been in trouble. So can you just briefly explain the compensation, and then also just deal with um, uh, the particular point about comments? Yeah, and I, can I just add on to that? Sure, um, of course. People moving from different parts of the area, it's a system called NUSAC. Um, and, it, and it's a, a regular setup at all points for, for storms or incidents. And it, traditionally, 
Northern Power Grid have been a net exporter across the last 20 years. So we've been down in East Anglia, we've been down in, in the Bristol WPDs area and, and across in the lakes in ENW's area. But obviously this, this time they came to us. And the way it works is that as soon as you know you've got some issues, you put in a bid into the team every morning and they say, right, we've got damage. How many crews can we have? And we did, we did very, very well. And the, as Guy said, the arrangements worked very well. Practically doubled our workforce um, that was available to us. And that's why you saw the different badged vans uh, running around in our region. So that, that worked very well. And, and you know, we, we asked for more than we actually got. So there was probably two to 20 people extra we could have taken every day um, because Scotch Power had problems, ENW had problems, and WD, UBD. WPD had some problems. So that's, that's how that worked, and it worked very well. We even tried to, and we got it running a little bit on our contact center. Um, once we knew we were overwhelmed, we were starting to, if everybody doesn't know, you contact our contact center with 105, and you ring 105, whether you're in Bristol, Cornwall, London, or here. And that's a national system. And then it routes through to us if you're in Northern Power Grid. So 105 is our number. What we started to do was to route some of the calls through UKPN in London's um, servers uh, because they had no damage at all. It was difficult to set up, difficult to get running, and there's some lessons to be learned about how we how we do that. But certainly that was something that we did. I'll come back to the compensation point. So the working out of the compensation is complicated. That's the first thing to say. We try to explain it on our FAQs on our website because the the number you know I, I looked at it and said. Is there not just three levels of payment? You know, one level at say 250, one level at 750, and another level at whatever. And the answer is absolutely not, because it depends when you actually go off and when you actually come back on, which is what's called the guaranteed standard. Um, and Ofgem monitor that. And we have proper forms to fill in every month to go to Ofgem to explain where the faults have been and what compensation payments we've paid. In this particular storm, two things happened. One is we wanted to move at pace, and secondly, um, we um, decided the best way for us to do goodwill was to increase our payments to double what they are the guaranteed standard. So instead of seventy pounds, they became one hundred and forty pounds, and um, also to to remove the cap off German. The affected DNOs got together and agreed that the cap would be moved. Normally, there would be a seven hundred pound cap. And we've worked out with that in our region, the maximum that people could get is now 1,820. And a vast majority of customers that were sent checks, the 24,000 that were sent checks, um, equates to about 8.5 million. That's where we currently sit. We're expecting the final two, uh, 6, 6, about 6,000 6, checks to go that we're working through, which is about 1,000 gone this week. Um, these are the more complicated checks that we need to put together. They need to be worked out. Um, they're not, you know, everybody's not um, on the computer list in terms of names and addresses, as I explained before, because we don't send you a bill. So we haven't got up-to-date information for you, which we get updated from time to time. And when that comes in, then we could track that, that postcode, that house, that property, to a time that it went off and a time that it came back on. And then certain amount of people, around about a thousand people, have been in touch and said they've calculated that we should have sent them more, and we're working through that um, situation. That generally happens when there's a nested LV fault, so that we paid for the wider fault, but, and we expected them to be back up, but then there was a little bit off to their house that we didn't know about at that point in time in the computer system, and then we owe, we owe them maybe another two days or three days until that one was fixed. Those are being worked through now. Uh, I, I want to just stress that point that I know that we got some of those things wrong, but we did that in the benefit of trying to get 24,000 checks out before Christmas. And that's that's why we did that. And you know, I, I hope that you understand that was our plan. The other item of payments that we're making on checks is for welfare. So as well as the 1,300 hotel rooms and the food vans that we were paying for direct, um, if anybody, went to uh, take away or drove to a restaurant or whatever for dinner, then those receipts could be put in on a claim form through our system and be reimbursed. 
to date, as I speak today, we're about at three hundred and forty thousand pounds that we've paid out, and we've got we we've got about a thousand more claims that we're running through. We have a dedicated team of about forty people working through those claims, but they are complex. They do need to be checked out, and so you know again, about another three or four weeks, and we'll be through, we'll be through them as well. We think. Can I help you? Uh, yeah, and I think just so we're utterly clear. Um, there is a lot of things that government are going to make sure happen in the form of Ofgem and the like and the Department of Business to get better comms going forward. And, you know, quite clearly, this is going to be a company that is going to be very, very different uh, as it, as compared to what it was in November, December. Um, can I just deal with uh, one more um, elephant in the room, which has been raised on, by a lot of people, which is uh, why did uh, a, 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 an emergency situation not uh, be triggered by the local resilience forum at an earlier stage. County Durham did it a day earlier. Uh, what's the situation behind that? So uh, I'll address it. That we have got Phil Hunter here from the county council and John Riddle, who's your county councillor here as well. But I'll address it because it's a very easy answer. Really, the truth is it goes back to the state of knowledge of what um, uh, MPG has as an understanding of the situation and the way they're running their systems at that particular time. There was an expectation that things would be fixed a lot quicker than in reality it turned out. That is one of the reasons why many people were told, you'll be fixed in 24 hours, you'll be fixed in 48 hours, and it wasn't. Um, and I think the severity of the storm was just not grasped, and the difficulty of getting power on was just not grasped. Now, you can say with hindsight, everybody should have understood it better. Trust me, this is a real-time situation. Everyone's trying their hardest. Um, the way in which it then works is um, how that, and this is the one of the things we're looking at, how you deal with an emergency is you have what's called the local resilience forum. Now, the local resilience forum is all the key players from the police, the ambulance service, but particularly the county council, all the social services who identify all the vulnerable people so that then the, the county council do visits to the vulnerable people. So if there is an elderly resident who is getting a care package and gets the 15 minutes a day or for a 15 minute morning visit, the afternoon visit, or is on meals on wheels or on and is on residential care at home, they then get visited by the county council and they just get on with that. Now, clearly, though, there is a failure to communicate. We can all see, and it's, there's lots of reasons why, and I certainly got it as a member of parliament, individual county councillors and parish councillors got it, that that didn't then feed down as to who was doing what at a particular time. We need to get that better. But there is a simple answer that uh, it was not realised that the storm was as bad as it was and it was going to take as long as it did uh, to get necessarily and declare it a much more of a national emergency. Now, County Durham did it a day earlier. We did it the following the following morning. Uh, the simple truth, though, is I don't want to, and, and, and I met all the troops who were helping out and around of that. Um, there isn't a much difference that can happen uh, by saying it's a national emergency. Trust me, there's not much difference. The reason I say that is you've already got all the emergency services working. You've got every single power company working and people coming from all over the country to assist you. The only real difference is that you're saying we would like to draft in the army to assist on visits to the vulnerable and things like that. And in reality, there aren't that many. The army are just as blocked in as you are. They're just as struggling on power. They're just as struggling on all the other things. So we did get assistance uh, across the region from several hundred troops. Um, but they're, they're not qualified linesmen. They're not people who could fix... Um, even do, they can't even get their chainsaws out. They can possibly do it on their own base, but in reality, they'd be strongly advised, don't mess with trees if you don't understand them and you're not well qualified. And there is a process and there's an insurance process that is genuine for health and safety reasons that you can't just say to some squaddy, go and fix that power cable, go and chop that tree down. Now, they did help and they do, they add to it. And again, we're going to look at how it is we've done that going forward. Uh, but that certainly explains why there is the day difference uh, and I don't want you to think that everybody isn't all hands to the pump even before the national emergency is called. So um, I'm going to take some questions. Um, I feel like we've, got, we've given a brief board overview. I'm going to try and um, uh, see, see what the particular ones. Now, a number of people, and I'll read out one question, which I think is really important. I think MPG, it applies to, but it also applies to the government, which is uh, David from Rochester and Tony from West Woodburn and Samantha from Stonehalf, and I know the Keel, the Parish Council Chair, is here, and those are all communities that are represented by John Riddle, the County Councillor. All of them, and I'll combine the effective uh, essence of the question are, 
if this was to happen again, we all have village halls or a community hub. We don't have the capability at the moment to run that village hall or community uh, center as a emergency response center. How is it we're going to do this better going forward? And what assistance can be given? I'm going to slightly see whether um, uh, Paul wants to answer, but I'm particularly going to say this, which is as follows. There is such an easy, obvious way forward, which is, frankly, every village hall is going to need a generator. That's the obvious thing. And now, how we do that, who pays for it, what we do, who services it, all of that malarkey is complicated. But quite clearly, every village hall is going to need a generator. Secondly, you're going to need somebody on the parish council or that community who is in charge of and trained up and understands who can turn it on, has got the key and things like that. That then creates a village hall, which at the very least then has communications and has uh, heat and can have a kitchen and can do all the things that we need to do. Some have already got that. All right. And we all know that some communities have already got that and are able to be match fit already. But to be honest, most of the village halls in this community in the upper north time don't have that capability. And it is patently clear that this area, Allen Valleys and other areas, need to have that ability going forward. And that's something that John Riddle and I are very, very much live to and are working on. And clearly, the Ofgem report of how you do interim power generation to an emergency hub is really, really key. But I have to say, I think MPG have a role to play here. And look, the bottom line is this, I was with Alex's team in Kielda. They didn't have generators and they're really ready for a real serious weather. They're looking at how they're doing stuff in Kielda. Uh, Northumbria Water are going to have exactly the same problem. They're going to need to be able to work out how they do this. Uh, Paul, does anything you want to add on that particular point? Because obviously, were MPG to step in and assist on this process, it would make a huge amount of difference. You may be forced to in any event. Uh, yeah, that, that's really true. Um, it's an interesting point, actually, about generators and how we, they were used in the relief. In that first week, we had 330 extra generators that we put on IEP and brought into the area and got got connected. And it depends how the network was broken, how to get people back on. Uh, I would stress that our focus was was rebuilding our network and getting the power from the right places. But then some of the thinking that was going on in the local um, town, you know, village halls, etc., like in St. John's Chapel and Weedale, started to move to a generator provision. And, you know, quite large generators on the back of law orders were being brought up with bowsers to keep them fed that would heat up these rest centres that we set together. And that got everybody starting to think about how that could be for the future. Um, and, you know, Interestingly, one of the reasons why I wanted Ian Miller to join us tonight is that we're, we're looking at a project called Micro Resilience, which we're running along to try and help um, to, to lift uh, communities in power for a short period on batteries. So as well as generators, you can use battery solutions, and we all know batteries won't last a fortnight, but once you've got the system set up in a village hall such as this, where there was batteries in that would take over immediately, then, because um, one of the big issues about generators, by the way, is that if you don't run them, maintain them, keep them clean, they don't work when you need them. But batteries generally do. Um, what we were thinking is that if we could get to a position where that's projects want to work, then maybe that would be the first place we take our temporary generators to. So there's, there's certainly a role that we're looking at. Yeah, I don't want to mention the Brian Brian's project. I was speaking to a couple of people from Bionis earlier on. Keep, keep your voice up. Sorry, I speak to a couple of people from Bionis earlier on, and, and I'd love to hear their views later as well. And the other thing it allows you to do is where you have things like solar power, you can charge the battery during the day and then the battery's there in the evening. So the battery is not a kind of finite size in that sense, it's a float, it's a, it's a storage capacity. You can have little wind turbines in rural areas, you can have um, solar panels in more um, urban or, or village areas. So it, it's, it's a starting point that you can really start to build things in. And we don't have to own that solar power. That can be solar power on people's, you guys' roofs. And yeah. you'll still be being paid for it when it's charging the battery. Charging the battery. Yeah, good point. I mean, just to bring the battery analogy well, more further forward, we have a number of vans called Silent Power, which just looks like a Nissan NV200. But inside it is a, is a battery. And when, when we go to housing estates, for example, where the LV mains is down, we can hook up a, a one of these vans and it doesn't keep people awake at night with a generator running all the time because it powers them on battery. 
that's definitely part of the future. Bigger and bigger vans with batteries on board rather than just generators. But obviously for a storm of people being off 12 days, then we would know that would run out. But what we were starting to think was maybe if we had a, a village hall that had batteries in like this that was collecting solar power, uh, that would provide flexibility and new services and smooth out people's electric bills via energy efficiency position as well. And then we would hook the generator into that. So that's me talking about. Okay, lady here had a hand up and I'll take other people who have had their hands up um, uh, as well. And then I'll turn to Wendy Brady's question after that. So yeah, I'm Samantha in Stonehouse. Um, our initial, it's been really interesting hearing the different sides of it today. First thing I want to say, an hour, it's been well, an hour well worth spent. Um, for us, um, the first primary, primary problem besides the power cut was the fact that we had no Wi-Fi, no phone signal, no internet. So any, you and many, 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 many others. Any, and your communications can be all singing, all dancing, but when you've got a little tiny community of 50 houses that don't have any communication at all, with some very vulnerable people in it, very isolated people in it, what are you going to do differently? Well, I would have thought that would have been an answer for British Telecom. So I'm going to come to BT. Um, <coughs> so why don't I'll take some of that? Um, because some of it goes to off gem government, apart from <coughs> business, and a sort of wider policy question. So, sure, by all means. So, um, in circumstances where uh, you, the power goes off, you've got no internet, you've got no mobile phone coverage, you've got no capacity to communicate even to the power company or even to your local authority or to anybody else. And effectively, um, and, and probably your road is also blocked, so nobody knows you're actually out there. What is the policy suggestion for how you fix that? Now, um, some of them go back to the point about having localized generators, localized power provision that Ian and Paul were talking about and very much we're looking at as local authority and county councillors of how it is we have an interim uh, capability. The problem is though, that there is there's two follow-ons from that. So at the, as a country, we don't, we're not capable of dealing with a widespread loss of power and then still having communications. The, there are two exceptions to that. The first exception is there is a radio network for the emergency services. And there are masks through Kielder and other places whereby for exceptional circumstances, terrorism, war, uh, severe incidents, the uh, ambulance, fire and police can communicate through that, that radio network. It's not a wider use for Mr. and Mrs. Miggins at Four Acacia Avenue able to use, utilize it. And it's very much an emergency service. And it's not also, it's got the same problems. And it, you can try and build a mast bigger and better and bolder and with more steel or more tension, they can still be blown over. And if you lose your mast, you lose your connection. So it does sort of exist, and that's always been the way that the country has run in exceptional circumstances. The separate problem is, so you, you should be able to communicate by BT, because you should have a landline um, that should be able to be capable of having a connection with a wider world, and you use it on a copper-based wire, just as we've always done. There are two fundamental problems with that. In several places, Otterburn, Elsdon, uh, Sparty Lee in the Allen Valley, uh, outside Pontyland as well, and, and certainly locally to some people uh, in our patch, that people lost the capability and whatever the BT infrastructure, that was damaged by the storm as well. And, you know, infrastructure can be damaged by it, some things like that. There is a wider problem, which is that BT, who are a national um, phone provider, are going to a wireless-based approach on an ongoing basis. That is part of the issue that the Department of Business are beginning to look at because it, it, it of course, makes sense. Get the country wired up with super-fast broadband. Please, God, we all get it fairly soon. Some have got it, some haven't. And then you can run, uh, phone companies can run stuff off super-fast broadband and get a much better connection and a much better capability than you can off an co old copper wire. The difficulty with that is if that all breaks down and requires on energy uh, that is from electricity, how do we then function? There is no silver bullet solution to that. There really isn't. And at the moment, we're, we're, just let me finish a second and I'll let people come in. There is no silver bullet in the sense that uh, you're still always going to be dependent on infrastructure. You still can be damaged by weather. 
and uh, there is a capability issue that as to how it is we're going to go forward. Some people, and I can tell you this is happening across Northumberland, particularly Tyndale, some people are buying small, gen small generators. And you can go to B&Q, Screwfix, some of these companies, and buy little baby generators that will power up your mobile phone, will make your computer work. It's not going to run your freezer. It's not going to run your life. But they are baby generators that are relatively easy. Now, that, there's still all the problems of maintenance and long term and everything like that. But it means you can boil a kettle. It means you can do stuff on an ongoing basis. None of this is perfect. The whole purpose of this inquiry, though, and the, what we're doing here today and what Ofgem, County Council and Department of Business are doing is come up with innovative solutions and ideas to tackle what is a national problem. Because it happens to have hit us in Northumberland and County Durham and in northeast Scotland, the three main areas it's affected. But it could have been in Wales, Northern Ireland, could have been anywhere. And the problem is common to this country. You want to come in, sir? Yes. Um, the situation of the copper cable. Um, we have an ex-door neighbour who's in his 80s. Now, he hasn't got the internet. And his phone was able to work during the storm, whereas if we had super fast broadband, we couldn't get anything. Well, that so you just highlighted the problem. Would it not be a good idea for British Telecom to have both systems to a house? But they're going to decommission the copper wire that's what it does well, yeah, yeah. so the, the problem also the, listen the, the blunt truth is the copper wire is finite it's expensive it doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily the future the, the, the what we should be trying to do is to work out how we have backup systems that creates the power for the interconnections that we do gentlemen there right why don't the government instruct BT and other telecoms companies to stop these transfers until such time as somebody has attached the brain part of the problem of providing backup because it doesn't exist, it's laughable. So the answer to that is that is a work in progress. I've got so I'm not going to read them all out, but I've got um I'll come to you in a second, sir. Um I've got a bunch of notifications from Vodafone EE and the various other companies. And the whole point about what the Department of Business should be looking at, and we're trying to persuade them to look at, is how do you make a telecommunications system interconnected and able to withstand extreme weather events? Now, there's a balance. Let's have the we'll have a robust conversation. As always, you know, it doesn't matter whether the government pays for it, comes out of your taxes, my taxes, or whether the businesses pay for it, comes out of the the, the, the cost of running that business. <laughs> Bear with me, I'll try and answer your question. There has to be a discussion about how it is you make all those things work. Now, that is part of what the Department of Business is looking at. Now, do I have the silver bullet from it now? No. And the way in which those work is part of the thing we're trying to do. The bit that I think I want to try and reassure you about is, is that the important bit is that they know what is going on. Because one of the reasons we're doing this, and our, you know, 60 of us are giving up our Friday night to get chilly in a village hall, is... Because it's important that the wider community off Gemma who are watching this matter live and the wider community in Westminster and beyond understand what we went through. Because my view is they don't really understand it. And that, that, that point has got to be got home. That's why we're doing public meeting. That's why we're asking you to write in. And I didn't make one final point, which is um, I'm going to try to simulate four public meetings over eight hours and all of the stuff you've written in into a submission, right? But I can't put everything in necessarily. So please don't be shy about giving your own written representations. And I've got a very good one, for example, from uh, Rochester earlier on that was sent in from the clerk there. But your own written representations to off chairman the Department of Business. I'd love you to copy me in so I've got a record of it. But don't be shy doing that because, you know, this process is ongoing. And I want to make sure that this community is seriously heard. Now, gentlemen there. So it's just about the resilience I, I work for uh, Row 2. Yep. A lot of people don't realise if you've got no service on your mobile and another network's working, you ring 999, the call will go through. So if your EE was off here, EE and 3 were on for about two weeks, O2 was off for 20 hours. So if your people say EE didn't have a signal on there, in an emergency, if you've got no service, try 999 anyway. If another network is working, your call will be connected. It's a very good point. Well made. And I mean, uh, there is a, a wider issue that in an extreme emergency that could be expanded to the 105 number potentially um that we will take up and that would be i'd love to hear a bit more detail about that gentlemen there and i'll come to the lady here right, um you answered one of my questions before about the contingency planning and uh, 
just a little word of encouragement for NCC. Uh, five years ago, they funded a generator for our house because I've got a, a handicapped child who's got, he's, he's registered blind. Just give we, me your address again, sir, because they don't know where you are. Oh, sorry, Tony Gibson from West Woodburn. Um, it's a little bit of a microcosm, just for what you're explaining. Yeah. We've been flooded about five times. So I had a generator installed, strangely enough, to work the pumps that we had installed with the grant from NCC underneath our floorboards. And that proved a lifeline for us. Is things like the telephone. People didn't realize that if you've got a mains power telephone, it doesn't work. But if you've got an old fashioned telephone and plug it in, it will work. We've got a UPS and an unattributable power supply, which will keep your internet working, working off batteries, small scale, just that big. Yeah. But I, what I'm trying to do is build in resilience to our house to look after our son. But it falls apart if you can't get petrol for your generator, <laughs> if you can't get out of the house to get food and water and such like. So I appreciate everything you've said, but it all boils down to one other thing. And John knows I've got a bit of a background in risk management in the NHS. But you've got to have good contingency plans, and I mentioned that as well. Yeah, yeah. And I know you've got contingency plans, but they didn't show up to be good contingency plans because they haven't been tested properly, I don't think. And I also think that NCC, with the local resilience teams, I think you've got to be much more proactive and then get the people who actually have had experience of these things involved in that back to people like myself. But uh, so it's good to have these meetings and I think you've done a good job there getting the people together. The meeting's not over yet, I could mess I it up. <laughs> I think it's good that you've done it. You've got to look at the policy side of things at of government course. levels. Yep. But locally, I think getting local communities involved so that they Church. can provide the resilience for the people like the lady next door to me who didn't have a phone working, but just lost her husband, can yep. be supported, yes. and this sort of thing. So, well done on one count. A lot more work to be done, especially on the power side of things in the future. I, I listen. Thank you for the contribution. I, I don't think it was anything we said you said that we disagree with. I do, I listen, I think that the local resilience forum, which is led by the county council, did a good job, and but I do feel it can do better, is a simple point. And I'm, I'm certain the connectivity of all the various agencies can be improved. I'm certain we can have better local resiliency, but I'm also certain that, listen, I've got at least a hundred constituents who've contacted me saying, look, I, I know you're trying to do better. I know MPG swear they're going to do a better job, but I am going to go and buy a small generator and I am going to uh, have a, a system whereby I, I'm going to make sure we're all, you know, I can assure you the uh, purchases of a spare can of petrol have gone through the roof, the little plastic canisters, everybody's gone and bought them, everyone's filling them up and sticking them in a garage and thinking, hope I don't need you, but if I do, I've got it. We're all going to have to be ready for this sort of resilience planning. I also know, very. I'm going to come to you, sir, don't worry. Um, I also do know that we've been through this with um, Storm Desmond and that this process can work and get you get genuine change uh, of both local communities, but also national organizations. These guys have got to take their resilience plan and frankly, throw it out the window and bulk it up, which is what they're going to do. And to be fair to them, they've started that process. But Ofgem, I mean, if you want to have a look online, obviously you have power now, but Ofgem, the, the actual, um, I can read it out later on, I haven't got it in front of me, but they specifically have the power to force them to come up with initiatives to change the way in which they provide energy. Now, uh, it's a proper independent regulator who will hold them to account. Um, the lady here, and then I'll come to the gentleman at the back. Yes, uh, two things really. Uh, my name's Aunt Barbara from Kirk I'm, I'm Kirk Parish Council. Regarding local resilience and um, the response of the council, no dispute to Kirk yet, uh, we do feel quite abandoned. Um, but also, uh, we talked about this being a you know, once in a lifetime storm. As was Storm Desmond only five years ago, obviously these things are going to get more and more uh, frequent, particularly uh, I mean, something like this is going to speed up the process because we've lost so many trees. So um, the effects of global warming are just going to get worse and worse. Is there, a, is there any urgency about all these plans that you've spoken about? The government know um, 
you know, how often this is going to hit this this area and everywhere else in the country? So I think, listen, um, I, I, I'm not a linesman, but we've got some people who've got practical experience. And last night we heard from several linesmen who, would, who genuinely said, this is the worst example of a power outage type storm that anybody in living memory is aware of, without any shadow of a doubt. Now, are there going to be other storms in the future? Are we going to have different flood events, whether from climate change or just from simple weather? Yes, those things are going to happen. Um, the urgency, I think, is, I'll give you three examples. The first is, you know, at the soonest possible moment with uh, COVID and other things, we're having a bunch of public meetings all across the county, right? And I accept, I haven't done one in Kirk Welpington, but at the same stage, much like the very nice lady from Ingo said yesterday, you haven't been to Ingo yet. Um, Ingo is a community of eight houses. Now, uh, the simple truth is we'll do the main four, and if I need to do more when it comes to uh, the further spring, we'll do more. Now, I don't do you, I mean the county council. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'm coming to them, don't worry, I'm coming to them. So the county council are doing a scrutiny committee, and, and that has already started, that process, they've done the terms of reference, that's ongoing. The main two, and, and no disrespect to me and this community and the county council, the main two players, though, without a shadow of a doubt, is Ofgem. So Ofgem have serious power to force companies to do different things. Now, that, in my view, is the main thing about how these guys are better prepared for the future. And you know, I'll, I'll let you come in a second, Paul. Um, and the second bit is Department for Business need to look at the wider impact on business on the way in which the particular the BT point and other points. Those two reports, just so you're aware, are one of the reasons I've shotgunned these things into January. Those two reports are probably going to be completed in their interim form by about Easter. It's still so off Gem, now the off Gem nor the Department of Business have given a definitive date. But they're certainly looking to try and do this much sooner than later. It could be as soon as March. So the off-gen talk on their website about March, I think that's optimistic personally, but I'm not going to hold them to it. And they are an independent regulator. Our government doesn't run them. But the principle is they very definitely want to do a report very, very quickly. Because, all, and trust me, all of these companies from Forest England to Northumberland Water to MPG have already started this process. But... Uh, well, do you want to come yeah. on? I, I, yeah, I, I want to pick up on the climate change point, actually, and it was raised last night, uh, and I didn't get a chance to, to talk a little bit about climate change. Of course, we're worried about climate change, and we're worried about how to change our assets. Um, and there's a lot of evidence about um, some colder times and some very much warmer times, which have an impact on us. And there's a lot of evidence about floods because of heavy, heavy rainfall, which affects our underground cable network uh, in a big way. So there's a lot of evidence in there, those areas, and you'll see we've got climate change and environment planning reports on our website as part of our planning going forward. But there's not much science or climate change evidence around strong winds that come from the north, uh, particularly, which would, be, which would be this storm. And, you know, talking to the Met Office peeps, they reckon you probably have to go back to 1953 to see something like this. Um, there were dip we've got a lot of storms tracked um, as we go through our um, major incident plans. And for to have these two lined up, these two issues, which was one, the ice in the air, and two, the, the gusting. Just to give you an idea, a gentleman from Forestry was talking about 100 mile an hour winds, which is great because I forgot to mention it. Um, that's what we're dealing with. Roughly speaking, our overhead line engineering standards we know if we get gusts over 70 mile an hour we're in damaged um, areas and um, you know we're hoping for one or two storms a year with one or two hours over 70 mile an hour that's the sort of world that we live in once you get to 48 hours of 90 mile an hour gusts we know we've got um, mass devastation and there's not much climate change evidence that that's part of what's coming in the future we will have to go back and check that. That's something that we will be doing. And we've got um, projects running with the Met Office, um, particularly around lightning, because we, we track lightning storms because they cut our overhead line systems down um, and cause us uh, flashovers. And we know, for example, as threat zero, threat one, threat two, you know, have the information for you when they go up. And we get an email every day to tell us when we're going into lightning zones because we know that's a problem, but not storms like this, there's no climate evidence that covers a storm like this. 
Okay. I'm, I'm going uh, I'm to take, call it John Riddle, and then I'm going to take the gentleman in the green jacket. John, do you want to just say a few words? <laughs> You'll need to speak up a bit. Yes, I will. I think uh, the real saviour was actually the communities and the community spirit that we've got in the, in, among yeah. everyone, you know, helping each other. It's, it's the real saviour. Um, the first hand I really got involved, I suppose, was four past six in the morning when I had a telephone call because I'm a portfolio holder for local services, which is roads, basically, and other things. That had over 300 roads blocked with trees down, you know, which that was a massive job. You know, I think our staff did a great job in actually getting the roads passable as quickly as possible. But I'm not here to, you know, see gratitude for that or anything else for our staff. Um, I think, you know, when you get a storm of such magnitude and velocity, you know, it pulls up root balls, and root balls pull up underground cables as well as overhead cables. And, you know, it's going to be very, very difficult to mitigate against something like this happening again. We're going to have an impact again, whatever we do. Um, I think of all the emergencies that I've ever been involved in, the main problem has always been communications. And it was communications again this time, in my mind, that was the main problem. Um, you know, people being on the phone for hours trying to get through the Northern Tower. Uh, and then what, when we were days into the storm, I think the main criticism I've got is the fact that, you know, not the men that were doing the work, the lines were excellent, but actually the information coming back from the Northern Tower grid that the power will be on tomorrow, power will be on tomorrow, will be on tomorrow. This happened, I think, on three consecutive days at Rinsdale, for instance. You know, that's just not acceptable because, you know, we could have made other arrangements as well. So, you know, um, just think, those are just a few points. I'm sure there's loads of things we can learn. Uh, there are a series of scrutiny committees uh, taking place at County Council very soon. Uh, and, you know, we will be calling uh, for evidence, etc. So, okay. Thanks, John. Gentleman in uh, the green jacket. Yes, please. Oh, thanks. It's a simple question, really, going back to the. Um, telecommunications problems that a number yeah. of people had and the, uh, the value of a copper landline um, our neighbours who have retained their copper landline were able to continue to run out whereas we couldn't and would it not be reasonable to ask BT to make a policy to leave the, the copper lines in when they transfer to, uh, to the uh, it's certainly system. something we're going to feed in very strongly and it's certainly something we're going to feed in very strongly. And also, I'm going to make the point, I'm amazed how many people have gone and bought a phone. Um, it is genuinely, there's a, there's a bloke in Hexham who you was selling them, uh, and he sold out because everyone has gone, I got rid of it ages ago, but I now want to get it back. Um, there was a gentleman there who wanted to have his hand up, and then I'll come to the lady just here. All right, yes, sir. Thank you, Jim. We all come from great We didn't suffer too much. We were off for about three or four days. The niggle was, I got through to you on the phone, but for information, contact our website. How? Yeah. Of course. Listen. The second point, you got. the drive of the government to go for non fossil fuels, there was a lady on the, in Alston, which was brilliant. She said the electric fire's coming out, and the, the log burner carries in. We were fine. We got the fossil fuel fire. You know, if you were going to go all electric, it's got to be more dependable than this. So, listen, you are highlighting a problem that everybody understands, that basically, if you are require, requiring electric to run everything in this country, what is your backup plan? How are you going to be able to cope with it? And what is your provision for emergency provisions and, and specialist organisations? We uh, we fire on. <laughs> we all weren't short of firewood. I accept that. You know, uh, we all suddenly acquired that, and, and it was a great deal. Okay. Um, yes. Yes. And um, just, I wanted to ask the local resilience forum: Why were parish councils not uh, allowed, allowed to represent on that forum? Okay. Um, also, can I ask John? Yeah. And um, during the scrutiny, John, that the public council are doing. For the, the storm, are the parish councils going to be able to uh, become involved in that? Because we are the people on the ground in the community. 
not the people that come to vote. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Bill, do you want to answer that? Bill, do you want to explain who you are as well? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, Bill Winter, I'm a director, one of a number of directors, and I was one of a number of officers who, who was helping to coordinate the response. We were we were based for about two weeks out of the fire service HQ of West Hartford, um, and as I say, coordinating the response across the county council with all of our partners. The local resilience forum. I think it's a really good point to raise about how do how does that engage better with uh, parish councils? I think we have to look at that. Um, the local resilience forum is, is very much a tactical and strategic group, so it's, it's it gets very technical, but it's essentially made up of sort of um, uh, uh, primary and secondary responders. So you sort of you have your emergency services, the council, your utilities. Uh, and some other key partners like Mountain Rescue and so on. So, so there is a practical question about how you would sort of manage to sort of um, you know, you know, get sort of over 200 parish council representatives into that and still have a kind of functional body because, because it meets in, in these emergency situations, and we were on an emergency situation from the outset, it's meeting two or three times a day and it's making tactical decisions. However, there is an issue about how we communicate with parish councils. How we and what we're, we're thinking about this, how we communicate. We did do some communication with parish councils about what we were doing and what they could do. But moving forward, it's about what our parish councils' contingency plans like, how the mayors link into the, the overall counties' contingency plan, uh, and, and how do those two things operate together, and how do we understand that. So, so I think you've raised a good point. I, I'm not going to stand here and say we'll get 200 reps or two no, more I'm not expecting but, you to yeah. do that, but there's yeah, no sure. communication between the forum and the parish council as far as I'm aware. What we did, yeah, I, I, I mean, what we did was, um, I think it was on the Sunday of the Monday, probably the Monday afterwards, we sent out a, 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 an email with went out to all of our county councillors to have an update on the situation, what we were doing, what partners were doing, uh, and we, we, we copied in the, the parish council parks to that. But I suspect we ran into the same issues that everyone else ran into, is that we were emailing them. What, what was more effective actually was as the week went on uh, and, uh, and when the army came in, we had to reach over 4,500 households because by the Friday that's what we knew was still going to be the next weekend. We did a bulk school, we got leaflets, and that's what the army were growing on the ground, handing out leaflets to people. I don't believe that that's going to invest if we couldn't find them anyway. I, I mean, I think we were always going to run into some of those issues. What we did manage to do was get people on the ground to say, these are your options. This is a leaflet, you can go to a hotel, NPT will pay. In that situation, no communication is going to be perfect. But we are looking at all of that and we are certainly looking at how. And then on the point of the scrutiny, absolutely, um, the scrutiny um, committee that we're going to look at this, absolutely want to get the parish councils as well as residents. Because we had a situation in the Washington Bay where there was army on the training area and off the bird camp. It could have been deployed to get messages out to communities, but the work, they were just pushed away. Once, uh, once, uh, whatever. So I, I, I can answer the army point, and I'll, I'll, I'll deal with that, and I'll follow up on Bill's point, and then I'll call him Paul. So the, the whole purpose of what we're trying to do with this off-gem business inquiry is that, the, the, I'll start again, the local resilience forum operates in every county council in the country, all right? So you, wherever you are, a disaster occurs, the, the, the tried and trusted model, which has been evolved by successive governments and successive local authorities, is you need the key emergency players in the room. And if necessary, if it's a mountain rescue particular point, then obviously they're a bigger player. But if it's flooding, then obviously Northumbrian water and the water people come into much, much greater focus. But the main bit is obviously the person who knows who, for example, the vulnerable are, are basically social services, which is run by county council. So there is a there is an emergency response team and they, they pick a designated hub. Every county council has. R1 is the West Hartford Fire Station, uh, which has got obviously emergency comms and everything like that. And that's the that feeds into government and everything else at the same stage. There is a legitimate criticism, which I definitely believe is the case, and you highlighted as well, which is um, it, it's wonderful that what they did, and they did a great job. And this is, trust me, this is what happens up and down the country. Similar councils, similar people, public servants working really hard, and they work flat out for two weeks. But the ability to communicate with, trust me, I was being inundated. I have six members of staff, 
all we did for two and a half weeks was Storm Arwen, nothing else. You know, every other correspondence, every other query went on the back burner. All we did was try and get people generators, for example. That, I became suddenly a generator broker. Um, and But my communication through the local resilience forum was pretty limited. And they're not contacting, you know, you're getting upset as a parish council. Trust me, as the member of parliament for 62,000 people, I was quite upset that I wasn't being informed of what's going on. Now, eventually, I just got my car and drove there and, and, and then went and met everybody. But obviously, it required me also to have the trees cleared at the end of my road so I could drive somewhere. It, there is a way in which we're going to have to look at this. We get better communication between the LRF up and down the country when we have situations like this. Without a shadow of a doubt. And we can do it. And the reason I'm confident we can do it is if we had a flood event six years ago, we weren't as well prepared. Flood event now on the River Tyne, we are really, really well prepared. You can, I'm just going to touch some more on that one. But we are a lot, lot better prepared. And the, the communities who are on the Tyne have got flood wardens. They have flood action plans. They communicate. Northumbria Water and the County Council have regular meetings. They go out to the parish councils and talk to them. That sort of stuff has started. Now, hindsight being a wonderful thing, we did it for water and flooding in the past. We hadn't necessarily anticipated this sort of event here. Can we get this better? Definitely. Is this a process in hand? It is. I'm going to come to the questions. I'm going to let Hall come in on this particular point. Yeah, and I'll come to the lady there and the lady here. On the parish council uh, point, we, something that we picked up in our stakeholder engagement team when we were in Weirdale um, was the people came to see me and my colleagues that were up there. It's like, if only you could have routed some communications through us in the early days. And um, when we look at our systems, we have what we describe as a key stakeholders list. For example, Guy uh, would be on there, he'd be receiving bulletins um, for, about the story as we were progressing and the progress we we're making. But we don't have a lot of parish councils in there. So we've taken a lesson learned straight away that we're going to try and find all of the parish councils using off the back of this storm hour, uh, get the contacts, get them into key stakeholder briefings and start sending proactive messages out there because one of the issues was there's still an issue about communications, emails down, texts down, and all of that story. But if you've got a route of somebody, a name and address, or a name and a mobile phone number, there's a fair chance that they'll pick that message up. Because one of our problems with outbound calls um, is you can ring somebody, but when we're ready to speak to you, we're not all that you are sometimes not ready to speak to us. So we, we we're only about 35% likelihood to find somebody when we do an outbound call so getting somebody where we leave a message on a mobile that's got a link into a named person in my team and we can we can get better communication that's a lesson that we picked up we're going to bring the parish council um uh, the lady at the back there and then i'll come to you again um, and the problem with all these great plans is certainly we were without electricity for almost a week. And we were trying to find friends in other parts of the county who we could go and charge our mobile phones. Of course. Once that came back on, we thought they only asked for 24 hours, 12 hours, whatever it is. But I thought that if those people on the ground in the villages and rural areas, you could actually have. And not just the generator in the village hall, but that could be a centre for emergency yep. care. So you have internet, you have enough phone lines, yep. but you have your copper phone line going to the village hall so that whatever else is happening, I mean, for us it would be half an hour's walk to the village hall, but it's better than not being able to get anything at all. So let me, let me address that. So there is already, so uh, Northumberland County Council, for example, and the LRF, the Local Resilience Forum, actually did food supplies and various other supplies to certain key destinations. An example is Allendale Village Hall, right? Um, so the principle of we should have designated hubs as emergency places is already happening. What didn't happen is it wasn't as wide as we need it to be, all right? So there's a twofold follow-on from that. You, you could, know about it if you've got no communication. Of, of course, but then slightly, the, the future surely should be that you know, we all are going to have to talk to each other a lot more. We're all going to have to write to each other and communicate it. Individual parish councils, most of whom have got a parish council newsletter, 
whether it is online or whether it is handed out around the village, are going to then have a situation. And there will be a designated person on that parish council who is the emergency responder, effectively, and who probably has the key to the generator. And one hopes that they then tell somebody if they go away on holiday. You know, all that sort of stuff is going to have to be done going forward. Now, um, there is there is real argument that you would take a hub. We happen to be in one right now. The biggest uh, town in the centre of the Upper North Town is clearly Bellingham. You probably have one at Otterburn. You can see maybe, in, obviously, in Kielder, there's going to be a need. You'd have a hub where it should be a much bigger hub. And as we know, uh, NPG and the local resilience forums in Durham and in Northumberland and to a lesser extent in Cumbria did have such hubs. We could see them on TV. We could see people going in there. We just need to widen that and we need to get better prepared for it. That is part, exactly part of the process. It's what very much, and, and slightly, whatever government says, is what we in Northumberland, in my view, should be doing. And that's partly what the Northumberland County Council scrutiny is going to look at. Uh, you had another question, yes. It was not so much a question, more a positive thing. Um, okay. It's about mobilising volunteers. Yes. Because, you know, this local resilience forum, you know, I put my hand up and said, what can I do to help? You know, I'm able-bodied, I've got a car, where can I help? But I didn't know who to ask or where to go to. So if there is a network, can we please have volunteers? So there is a, there's a really easy example, which is, so the social services know who are the vulnerable people in their community, all right? And if this is 30 to 50 years ago, we would all probably know who it was, but we don't necessarily know every single person in our street, in our particular community. And there is a way going forward, obviously data is an issue, there's no question, you, you can't share particular data, but at least tell the parish council who are the people above the ages of 80, who is in the social services receipt of uh, stuff, who needs medicines? So there are plenty of people who needed emergency medicine supplies. And that though, and every community has them. Now, if a sufficient number of those people know, then there is a way forward to do that. That's kind of exactly what we need to do uh, as a sort of local parish communities, village communities, you know, even smaller than a parish, uh, to say to ourselves, all right, we know that events will happen again. How is it we're going to do that? And frankly, talk more to our neighbours. And this is a, a great lesson for all of us, frankly, that we can do. I'll come to you, sir, very briefly, but I'll, I shall come to Alex first. Go on. Thank you, Guy. Um, yeah, thank you. Two points. One was, uh, I'm not surprised tonight it's been about communication. That's a big issue in North Tyne Valley. Yep. Um, I've been here nearly 17 years. The Scottish borders, so I hate to say it, are just streets ahead of us now. If I go to the top of Hill, that what our most remote is Mount Victoria at Bloody Bush. I get brilliant phone reception and the Wi-Fi and everything on the phone because Scotland's got a mass just over the border. This has been a long issue in this area for a long time before COVID, yep. before. And Forest England, the Cumbria Water, we've got, you'll be aware of this. We've made many representations. I've written letters, can't remember written to yourself. Yeah, you have. Can we at long last get that on the agenda? Because actually, what's coming out, I think, tonight strongly is, and I can assure you, for those in the village who weren't aware, if you just went beyond the golf course like I did in the Saturday night, I was able to get communication to my truck. I was phoning different people about the emergency situations, correspond to each other. But then, the minute I came back down towards my house, I'm off road again. And that, that was a big thing. If you only went two or three <laughs> miles outside Bellingham, south or north, you had really good mobile phone connectivity. Yeah, but if you haven't got transport, or the, or the woman next door is 85 Well, years I'm just coming down on screen. Yeah, so, to my mind, what we need to address as, as part of all this is get more mass in which you've got backup. Yeah, for the communication because then the communications can work a lot better. So, go on, you go. And, and the second point was backing up this lady. I think where we did get it wrong, I and mean, John's really right because we, those of us involved with what we do, we were all getting hit first thing in the morning with information we need to get out there. I was getting it very patchy in my truck, but actually, when I'd done all that, if I'd known what was needed to be in Bellingham, and the point is, I know it's good to come to staff who live in this village. I know it's good police officers who live in this village. We could have all come in here as a group and said, right, what do we do next? We've done the immersion bit, we've done. And that the bit was because I don't know who I should be speaking to. No, the bit I exactly. So um, I, I didn't come to your army point, and I'll come back to that because I didn't actually answer that point. So on the mast, as you know, there's an application to go at, um, I think it's Glen Shee, just outside of Greenhalf, that John and I were speaking about only uh, last week, uh, that there is an application in 
obviously, if you object to that now and you're in this room, I'd be a little disappointed in you. Um, but there is a so there is masks going in, and it is getting better. But of course, we need to do more. There is a there's a couple of slight complications on that. You'll be aware that the problem on Kielder is also linked to Spade Adam. So we have military bases, and we have the same problem in Centre Pontevedra. You don't have great um, uh, mobile coverage because the airport say that uh, masks interfere with their radar and their technology. At Spade Adam, you have a you know the country's number one, in fact Europe's number one. Uh, combat aircraft preparatory center where they quite literally fly at each other to try and prepare themselves for war. And they are saying we, we really can't have uh, anything nearby. Now, the argument is you might be able to do stuff that is not quite so close to Spade Adam and, and see what we can do. That will always be a slight problem. And trust me, I've got just as many people saying the one thing I love about Kielder is I've got no mobile phone oh, no. reception. And um, plenty of tourist companies are saying if there's one place on the planet <laughs> you want to come where you can actually genuinely, your wife or someone else's wife can't contact you <laughs> and you can't be in any way in front of your life and your kids can't contact you, your business can't contact you, come to Kielder. And there's plenty of adverts on that line. There, there is a middle ground though, but please, there is a mask going in just outside of Greenhalf, or just at the north of Greenhalf. Please don't object to it. Um, so can I just address the army point? And I'll come back to you, sir. So can I just before we leave the army point, can I just say at Rochester we have four masks within a five mile radius. All of them were down. We had to cross the border to be able to get four and signal two. Yeah. Uh, the the so Rochester, Otterburn, Sparty Lee and the Allen Valley, all those masks were blown over basically. Yeah. That's they've also got to have a look at how their capability is. Can I talk about the army? Because Again, it's a, uh, so if we had a flood incident, right, there is an established protocol whereby you can call in the army in particular. The obvious thing is a bunch of lads with, who are very fit and very strong and who can be well organized, can take sandbags, and there, there is a, there's a supply of them, and they can assist uh, the environment agency suitably directed. You don't have any insurance, you don't by and large have any health and safety issues, and uh, Albemarle Barracks have done that in the past and can do that in the past. Um, there is a real problem with uh, that the MOD, the Ministry of Defence have, and the Secretary of State for Defence have, uh, with being the army being regarded basically as a reserve force just to be utilised at any particular moment. Because their fundamental duty is to protect us in the, in, in the event of something more serious. And, it, and there is a definite conflict. So I sat down on the Tuesday of uh, Storm Arwen, so it's going to be going for three days. I had a meeting with the um, various ministers, I won't go into who they are or whatever, to say we really need the capability. I've got Otterburn Ranges, I've got Albemarle Barracks, which is literally next to Pontyland. I've got, I've got lads there who I could get to come and help. And there is a very strict protocol for utilization of army personnel. And to be fair, I fully understand that, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why um, the army take it very seriously before they say, look, we aren't the ambulance service, we're not this. There has to be a very clear reasons why we get involved. Um, now, on the ground, and I've got to choose my words carefully, it tends to be the case that provided you've got a really good working relationship with the commanding officer of the barracks at Albemarle, or the uh, ranges that you can tend to be able to say to them, look, we're in a difficulty, you're in a difficulty, can we all work together? Um, we didn't have that in that particular time. And trust me, it's a complication because the commanding officer of Albemarle Barracks changes every two to three years. So Lieutenant Colonel Murphy and I, I've got, I've still got his phone number. We text each other all the time. Lieutenant Colonel Chris Gent and I, very good relationship. The bloke who was in um, because of COVID, I didn't even meet him. Because of COVID, I couldn't meet him. And so I haven't got that relationship where I was going, can you assist us? Because definitely in previous disasters, I've been able to te literally text uh, the commanding officer and say, what, what can we do? There's a separate issue, which is the LRF and the ability of those people to say, uh, on the ground, can you assist? Because for example, at Albemarle Barracks, all their kids go to either Heaven on the Wall School or Stanford School. And if those schools couldn't have been made to work, trust me, I'm quite sure uh, the people would have got involved and assisted. It, it's a tricky one. It genuinely is tricky because 
there is a very clear protocol about how it is you use uh, military personnel. Um, I, can we try and improve it? Yes, we definitely can. And better relationships clearly is the way forward. But you can't just magic up troops to do stuff. And uh, it's amazing how fast they actually had ended up coming because it, it, there is a, you know, there's a there's a very definitely a chain of command. It, you may say that's a bit antiquated, but there's also good reasons why. This gentleman here wanted to come in, um, and I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you in a second. You've already asked one question. Yes, sir. <laughs> Are you planning on doing uh, further maintenance because the, the infrastructure um, is basically old? You were talking about wind speeds. Yeah, it will have to be wind speeds calculated on a new line, not something that's been built in the 1950s. On, on our farm, the majority of the lines, they, they are, I think, 1957. Uh, they definitely have no, they've had no maintenance. Some of the poles haven't. Uh, <coughs> Three years ago, I reported a poll that was so rotten that the rabbits going in the bottom of it. I was promised that it would be repaired uh, last August. Uh, that was obviously before the storm. No. Uh, the infrastructure is not good. You've got good protection of the system now, which is much better than what it used to be. Um, but I'm afraid that the infrastructure is, in some places, is very, very poor. So, you know, even looking at some of the footage on television, you know, some of the poles that granted these trees that brought the lines down, but the poles were rotten. You could actually see that the poles uh, were rotten. So, basically, what I'm asking shortly after the, the damage that's occurred, there's obviously a hell of a lot of work for you to do to get them back. But are you going to increase or ramp up the maintenance program because obviously that would actually make things more secure if the line is in better condition. The answer is that is 110% yes and if Paul is not going to answer yes I can assure you off Jim will make him and also what is going to happen is that your farm is going to get a visit. Whereabouts are you living sir? Just remind me. The Bratton Royal Farm. Okay and you gave your details to uh, Ian and Chris earlier on Right. You will get a visit very, very soon. Paul, do you want to try and address yes, that point? Of course, of rather course. unequivocal comments, please. So it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky one because in all of these situations, the, one of the first things that crops up is what was the state of the asset that went down in storm. And, you know, to, to give you an idea, we replaced 775 wood poles in that storm in them 12 days. Um, the poles that we've got down, and there will be some wrong, I understand where you're coming from, not saying that they're not. But we grade all the assets with a, a grading when we do foot patrols. And a lot of the poles that went down were, were graded one or two. So there's, there's, a, there's no, at this moment in time, with the time that we've had to do a review, and there will be poles looked at and checked, there is no um, direct situation that it was poor assets that went over and, and not and it was a lot of high quality assets that went over as well. So there's no, there's no big link, but the answer, the answer to the question is, do you do the maintenance on the poles? Yes, we do, on a rolling basis. So, you know, every year there will be vegetation management, so trees cut in, keep them out of the lines, there'll be poles replaced on an age and asset condition basis. Um, you know, we report that through to Ofgem all the time. They monitor that. In fact, up until this price control that we're entering into now, that was one of the major things that Ofgen checked us around was are we actually improving the asset base? And so we've done quite a lot of that asset base. I don't know whether Matt or, or uh, Jeff want to come in. Yeah, I'll, I'll answer that. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. Well, so, uh, good evening again, everyone. Uh, what I would like to say, as I said, I'm, I'm the general manager for the factory of the North East. I look after all of Northumberland County, but also the Tyne and Weir. As we've heard, this was big. We, we talked a lot about the the rural areas, this obviously impacted a lot of urban areas as well. I, I live out through the side of Newcastle towards the coast. Had a lot of damage out there in the urban areas as well. With regards to the inspection regime, this, this is governed in policy, but also by, by the regulators again. So we have to have strict 
inspection regimes from foot patrols, again, these helicopters. So we survey the, the networks using thermal imagery, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's a very strict cycle we go through. As Paul said, roughly 25% of the assets that failed were in very, very good condition. We'll invite a comment from Jeff in a minute. We've certainly got examples from some of our engineers of almost brand new assets that were severely damaged. Metal cross arms at the top of holes, the metal was, was twisted with the force of the wind and the ice. So I understand we have all assets out there as well, and we will look at those, and obviously we'll, we can design some of these uh, off the system. But the, the scale of this was, was, was such that it wasn't just old assets, there was almost brand new assets that were, were damaged as well. Jeff's one of my engineering managers, is, is an ex linesman as well. So again, Jeff, do you want to share your views, Jeff? Yes, sir. I mean, um, I've spent the last 35 years predominantly doing overhead rebuilds, so that's what I've done for the whole career. And um, we've probably done more of this area than anywhere, to be fair. There's always going to be more to do because we've got that many assets, but you know, I haven't given the specifics on the areas we have worked on. We've done an awful lot. And we do build them to a, to a good standard. But with that sort of wind and, and that sort of um, trees, barns, all sorts of lines, a brand new pole or a rotten pole is still going to come down, unfortunately. Um, the newer lines are better. We, we move the wires further apart so birds don't get across from etc. So it, it's certainly improved and it's better. But I think the extent of this um, storm caused the damage to the world. Yeah. All right. I'm going to let the two of you have a debrief afterwards with Dennis, and somebody's going to go to his house and his farm very, very soon to sort it out. I think it's a good thing to remind, and I managed to find it, and apologies, I should have said it before, and then I will come to you, sir, and then I'm going to wrap up fairly soon. So the off-gem inquiry does, um, and I'll just read out the, the three key aims of the review, which is it was set up on the 9th of uh, December, establish what happened, set out clear lessons for improvement, the review will draw out good and bad performance so practice can be improved and issues addressed quickly. Secondly, determine whether there's any evidence that a network company, it's not just MPG, there are other companies up and down the country, have breached any of its statutory obligations uh, or license conditions and if Ofgem needs to investigate and further lead to enforcement action. And thirdly, use the lessons from Storm Arwen to feed into a wider review of climate resilience and network infrastructure and services. There is a whole bunch more on the Ofgem website if you want to have a look in more detail. I probably should have read that earlier. And as I say, they say they're going to try and do that by March. I think that's optimistic personally, but you can see the direction of travel. I'm going to take the gentleman there, and unless, uh, I've, but you've both asked questions before, so keep it brief if you can, and then I'm going to wrap up fairly soon. Thank you, Barry. Just three, Paul, just, you have a very important person for this. Yes, I registered my son on. Forget about my son, but those people are the people who depend on dialysis with questions, etc., for their life. My son doesn't. What I would like to know, though, is whether you're sharing that list with the various county councils, NCC, because you'll go across more than one county council. Yes. A, to make sure that the people that you've got on the list they know about, and the ones that are on your list are actually acted upon because when the comments went down, you wouldn't be able to get in touch with them. It's just reconciling that flow of information because we are a very vulnerable group. It's a good question. I don't personally know the answer to whether we but share the information. Phil, Phil does know, don't you? Yeah, what we, what we got from the NPG and the investment of NPG is the real data is different to us. Um, so the information they were giving us about the, the properties that were still that remain without power. And there's a marker on there for vulnerable. Didn't go into any detail, so there yeah. weren't any sort of breaches of data and so on and so forth. And we just have a marker on the postcode data. And um, obviously, we have a own list, so our adult social yes. services, our children's social services. And, you know, you know, yeah, and we were doing that from the yeah. outset. We were doing that all of that cross week and contacting everyone who was yeah. vulnerable, everyone uh, who the NHS had shared that information about, and we were also cross checking that yeah. with information. Yeah. Right. Just, it's just that point that if it is a dialysis equipment, you should have that double rate plan up on yours. But you got a call from us. I got a call from us. I have a hard one for that is the proof of the point. Yeah, the, 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 listen, there is a pretty good system out there that people definitely slip through the net. There's no question, you know, and can we get this better? Absolutely. 
there is a there is a wider issue as always with modern government about data sharing which is you know saying your personal situation about your personal physical uh, or any mental issues or whatever you've got um, and sharing that with a energy company or other people and who can it be shared with thereafter there's complications on permissions and things like that which is not easy to be fair and then you know if define an emergency when i i give full authority to share my information is not easy and there's a bunch of laws that go around it but can we do this better definitely we can um i'll come to yourself and then i'm going to try and address a couple of points as well and then wrap up very soon just a simple question really um so, Alex, do you want to address that? Because we spoke about it, I spoke about it with your team last Friday. So, the forest framework, we will be planting in the next That's a given. It's part of the UK insurance standard for managing UK forests. Um, we will equally work with utility companies take less in land. So, we will look at open space, how we can improve that, access routes, that. That's a very long journey we've started on. Uh, we have a lot of areas. The problem we've got, which we've already been talking about tonight, the wind has very much been a patchwork damage. You might have a clump of trees of 10 down, you might have a clump of trees of 2,000, you might have a clump of 20,000. That's, and that is all over the whole of Northumberland. If you go towards the Rothbury area, we have half, half the percent of forest flat, flat completely. So that's going to take a lot of time to work down. We then have to get the plants, young plant seedlings, to replant them. That's not a quick job because the UK nursery is only geared up. And as you're all be aware with climate change and what we're trying to do in the UK wide, everybody wants to plant trees because they're a good thing. But chuck in a storm on top of that, you just can't germinate all the millions of plants you need at the same time. So that this is a long, this yep. is a five, 10, 15 year program. But I can assure you, Forest England will certainly replant everything that's part of a crop or open space landscape. The private sector equally have to, for it gets a bit complex, I'll try and do this very quickly. You can clear up all windblown trees, however, if you're in the private sector and don't have a forest plan, you must then get a license from the other part of Forestry England, which is Forestry Commission, so that part of the Forest Services. Um, so that's not a quick process either, and that's to make sure that people don't just gun roll fair on the countryside, as you can imagine. So it has got to be done in a managed way. They will equally have the same pressure we've got to get young saplings, if you like, to go and replant the, the landscape. So. I'm sorry it's a bit complex. No, no, it isn't. It will happen. I spent two hours uh, having a long chat with uh, Alex's boss and various of the four of the lads on the ground in Kielder last week. Uh, and then we spoke with the Secretary of State, so the Minister for Forestry, at Goldsmith, uh, midweek, specifically on this, about what we can do. There's a whole, we can, trust me, this man could talk for quite a while on this issue. There's a whole bunch of stuff about which trees, whether it's a pine, a larch, a spruce, or an ash, can be picked up how quickly, whether you can leave it for a long period of time and it can still be utilized. You've also got 675 jobs at EGA dependent upon forestry supply. So, you know, that they're still gonna do, uh, you know, Keeler is a commercial forester to, to pay for all the other stuff. And that's gotta be supplied on a regular basis. So there's a bunch of stuff. They can't just say our number one task is to replant. They've also got to manage the forestry on an ongoing basis. And most importantly, they've got to make it safe. Because at the moment, uh, there's nothing to stop, I'm afraid, a very lovely tourist uh, from whatever country uh, getting in a car, driving up to Kielder and going for a wander. You can try and lock stuff, but we're just very conscious that we need to make sure that this place is safe, first and foremost. We're on that. So I'm going to do something which never happens, which is finish the meeting early. Um, I'm going to do a couple of quick thank yous. So first of all, Edwin at the back and his good lady wife, Patricia, have opened up the hall. They look after the hall. And John, you're going to regret what I'm going to say now. So as you can see, we, uh, we're trying to do this in a COVID safe way. And I, my instruction was we should open the windows. But the windows are so old in Bellingham Village Hall that they will not open. However, fortunately, John has a member's budget, which he's going, I have mentioned that he is going to be petitioned about so that if and when we ever did another lovely COVID-based winter meeting and wanted to open all the windows and get even colder, we might be able to do so. So we are going to take it as a task to try and help Edwin, Patricia and the Village Hall that we are going to look at how we can get these Neolithic windows, at the very least, to open 
uh, and we try and get them upgraded. But I wanted to say a massive thanks to Edmund and Patricia. And there was coffee, but everyone is so COVID conscious that very few people had coffee. But thank you for opening up the hall, making it available to us. It is massively appreciated. Yeah, thank you so much. And I look forward to coming to open the windows one by one over the next few years. Um, the, the second thing is, um, this, there is uh, all of these lads live local to the community, all right? And half of them have got the same problems that you have and were cut off just like everybody else. You know, Alex is not killed and things like that. But it is, they all work for either for the public sector or for private companies providing you with public power. So I just want to say a massive thanks because there's, you know, there's a lot of people come out. MPG have got five people here, North Henry Ward have got four, Forestry England here, County Council are here. They're coming to four separate, you know, they're loving their Thursdays and Fridays with me because they're all coming out on a Thursday and Friday. If you are a glutton for punishment, I've also got two very lovely police officers who are here to make sure uh, I'm safe, there's no terrorist attack, and they're also part of the emergency response team. There's a lot of people who work really hard to make this happen, and I'm really grateful to them. And also, more particularly, they're grateful then to engaging with all of you because this sort of stuff doesn't just happen. They've got to decide as a company, as an organization, that they're actually going to engage. And that is a continuous conversation. And some of you will want to have chats on an ongoing basis. Some of you will get a visit to make sure your uh, rabbit infested poles are fixed. Some of you are going to speak to uh, Ian and Chris at the back who have got ongoing queries about your bills, your um, uh, names are wrong or the checks are wrong. But my final thing is to yourself, thank you for deciding what you really want to do in the chilly January night is give up your evening. Uh, we are all here to try and make this better and to get us better, more match fit in the future. It is massively of assistance. There are a lot of parish council chairs and representatives here. Uh, John is your county councillor. Uh, we are all taking this on board and we all want to try and make it work. Uh, and my team will also have done an amazing job. But thanks very much indeed. Please leave it a COVID safe way. Please, if you haven't had your booster, have your booster. And I hope to see you all in much better times. Thanks very much indeed.